Hi. Right, so recently I've been starting to look at my family tree and the purpose of doing this video really is so that I can pass this across to family who are interested and basically want to know the facts without reading the whole tree. But what I've discovered is that some of the people on the tree were actually um, quite cool really and I thought other people might be interested in the video as well. Um, so here we are, I'm about to get attacked by a cat. Hello. Um, so this video is called The Many Faces of Geoffrey Langley. Now, now if you um, were to Google Geoffrey Langley or Sir Geoffrey de Langley or any of those things, you get the same sort of key snippets of information come up that um, he lived in Pinley, Coventry, um, or that he lived in Middleton in Kent. So straight away, there's two people. And um, you get all sorts of random facts where I don't think anybody's particularly looked at it in a family tree perspective before and realised that the dates can't add up for them to be the same people. So it's been a bit of a game, let's say, to try and work out who's who. And I still can't because we're going back to 13th century, early 13th century, even uh, uh, late 12th century in some cases. So I can't be sure which... Jeffrey, each fact belongs to and they're all kind of interlinked and then to make it more confusing um, the last of the West Midlands Langleys um, Isabella de la Paul married into the Kent Langleys in the, the 1300 the 13th century ish and as a result the Langley, Car Langley cartulary was created listing all their lands so what happens is that in terms of looking at ancestry where an ancestor are they're both sides and any side to a point is related except for edmund of langley who was given the lands of langley i think the lands and the name not actually being blood related because he was actually the brother of edward the fourth got that so Let's slow it down again. So we have, first of all, one of the key facts. I'm going to take it back to where the more facts are, let's say. And so I'm going to take it back to Geoffrey de Langley of Pinley, Sir Geoffrey de Langley. Now, Pinley is just on the outskirts of Coventry. I worked there for years without knowing this. And he owned a manor house there and quite a few bits of land. Now, if we go back from him, first of all, his father, Sir Walter de Langley, was also a Pinley. So he's got his legacy there. And if you trace his family back, you can trace him back to the Halo family from France who came over with William the Conqueror and uh, there were Normans. So he's of Norman descent of the father's line. Um, Walter was married to Emma de Lacey. Now again, there's two Emma de Laceys. This Emma, I think, is the lesser known Emma of the Emma de Laces. but either way she comes from her Eros Lacey so she's um, a child of the de Lacey family again coming from Lassie in France coming over with William the Conqueror the de Laces are big lords and earldoms over in the March of Lords and over towards Wales and Ireland big family there so we've got quite a good pedigree provenance coming over from Normandy with that side of the family their son well, first of all, them. They are big contributors to the Knights Hospital as the Knights of St John of Jerusalem. And um, the de Laces are a crusading family. And um, anybody who didn't fight contributed towards the hospital. So whether William of de Langley ever fought, I'm not sure. He could have been a hospitaller. He might not have been able to fight for one reason. You can't find that information out. Um, but either way, they supported um, the crusades from the hospital point of view. They then have their son Geoffrey, and Geoffrey inherits Pinley. He inherits Pinley in around 12, uh, 1222, when he's, depending on who you believe, um, about eight, seven or eight. Um, I think his birthday is around 1215. Um, other sites have got him confused with a different one, I think. So I'm going with around 1215, which kind of fits with the time scale of his life to be the right sort of ages to be doing the different things. Um, he marries and inherits more land. So 
by the time he's an adult, a, a fighting age adult, he's got lands in Coventry, um, in Sidington, in Gloucester, which he got through marriage. Um, he's got um, Hazley, lots of places in and around um, Warwick that we know of, um, Warwickshire places. Um, and he basically just keeps growing his empire, for want of a better word. Um, he is known to the royal family um, and, and working with him. And he enters into the royal curia and, and serves to the crown in 1233. And he is well liked he's very loyal very royalist and um he rises up to the position of knight deputy to the earl marshal and a marshal of the household and then he um is employed as a proctor in ecclesiastical affairs and working with the church a fair bit in 1242 the gascon campaign he really um earns his reputation really he um fights for the king um goes off and when he returns he's won his freedom from the um the court of the king um on return from the gascon campaign in about 1242 to 1243 and as a reward he was given arundel or arundel to live in arundel's a bit out of frozen in it so Arun, arundel i can't say it i'll spell it he was given that to manage um, as, as his own land and he was also recruited to the forest air. Now, forest law um, was a Norman um, way of keeping the peace. Um, the Normans being the, how should I put it, the peace loving people that they were. Um, both sides of the Trent, there was the Royal, there was the Royal Court, both sides of the Trent, um, from what I can gather, I'm not an expert on this, but um, forest law was um, implemented across the territory and basically there was um, a justice on the north and justice on the south side of the Trent who were responsible for um, all matters of law and would tour around the country keeping the peace. Um, Geoffrey was on both sides of the forest um, up until 1252. Now when he was Chief Justice um, he came to the attention of Matthew Paris, the monk who wrote the, um, the Chronicle of Madura, and he's cited in that. And um, Matthew Paris refers to his parsimony, so how mean and, and greedy or tight, or however you want to phrase it, um, he was. And he was kind of notorious for that. Now, there is a belief maybe that the Chronicle is exaggerated, but he was certainly known as being quite a zealous royalist, very, very loyal to the king, and as the kings in those times basically wanted money and more money because there was lots of wars um we can probably assume he was quite good at getting money off people and quite good at making money where we needed to and doing what was necessary so probably not the most well-loved man and he was definitely working with the best interests of the king at heart at all times and it certainly certainly caused murmurings and um as payment for his sort of loyalty and um, help for the king, um, he was then given the uh, basically the height of his popularity was about twelve fifty two. Um, he was given the um, task of protecting the king's daughter, who was actually the Queen of Scotland, Queen Margaret of Scotland. Um, the king, in this case, being Henry the Third, um, his daughter. He was basically the escort for her and the guardian. So he's probably um, quite um, protective, quite um, handy to have around um, and protecting all sorts of interests for the, for the king and queen, the royal family, um, physically and monetary, I would assume. Um, he then goes on to protect, in 1254, he's protector of the young King Edward um, and all of the lands in England and Wales that are owned by the king. Um, then managing the lands of, of um, young Edward with the same level of parsimony and um, realistically probably cruelty, let's face it. Um, he was then responsible for an uprising which had united Wales. The Wales had been having a bit of a problem between itself, between um, you know, rebelling against their king and whatever. And there was a Welsh uprising in 1256 against the March Lords. Um, the English, the English and the March lands in Wales, um, March Wales, um, 
which is a whole subject on its own. Um, but yeah, Wales rebelled against those in 1256 and that's largely put down to Langley um, pushing them to, to that point. Um, he, he could have been made a scapegoat because um, the barons and the, the marcher lords were never fully um, peaceful, for want of a better phrase. Um, and you've got your barons' laws and all um, about barons' laws. You've got barons fighting with each other anyway in that sort of time. Um, however, he was exiled slightly for the time being. Okay, so in 1258, Geoffrey was pardoned for his role in the uprising and back to being fiercely loyal to the king Edward I. And he he had his lands. His lands were pillaged by Simon de Montfort, um, who led a series of wars and pillaging and unrest between the barons and the royals. And um, the Battle of Evesham, where he actually died, is actually this weekend and he's just up the road from here. So Battle of Evesham is something we've sort of not grown up with. You're not exactly taught it at school, but you're aware of it because there's posters everywhere. But anyway, going off the point. Um, so completely royal servant, completely loyal, um, did anything for the king and his, and his children. And he died in 1274 or before. He's, he's kind of not heard about. Once um, everything starts to get a bit tricky for the barons, um, he kind of disappears from the records. Um, and he's dead by 1274 and buried in Greyfriars in Coventry. Um, Coventry being a huge town in medieval times, um, still a huge town and also a town I know very well, I've lived there for sort of 20 years. Um, many monasteries there, Greyfriars being one of them, and um, it, it would fall into sort of the areas of Pindley and Warwick Wyke and where he, he was sort of owning by the time he died. Um, we do know that he exploited people um quite often taking land as payment for debts or dues or whatever he saw he needed rewarding for and um he was also responsible for persecuting quite a few uh, members of the jewish community and um, there was a huge community uh, huge persecution of the jewish um anti-semitic uh, issues around that sort of time as well um the king responsible, everybody responsible, really, and um, Geoffrey de Langley's no innocent, you know, he's just as responsible. He takes their lands, he takes what he needs to take, um, and grows his, his territory even more. Um, by the time he dies, um, he's been married, um, and married twice, possibly, maybe more. Um, one source has him marrying Simon de Montfort's wife after he dies. I don't think that's true. I can't. I can't find any proof of that, other than somebody saying he married. She, he married Anna de Montfort. Um, that would have also been the king's sister. So, I mean, whilst he was in those circles, and it's certainly possible, the fact that all the records for her say she went into the monastery, into a nunnery after Simon died, um, suggests that maybe he didn't marry her. But anyway, um, the people he did marry. Um, number of children which I'll cover in another video because there's some quite interesting things there as well but um, one of his children was called Geoffrey which makes um, researching Geoffrey de Langley that little bit harder so we've got Geoffrey who's born around 1215 dies 1274 loyal to King Henry to the kings I can't remember which ones they were now but loyal to the kings um, and, and fighting that way in the king's service protecting the lands, acting as justice, taking money, taking land, causing all sorts of rumple, <laughs> rumples and, and little wars within themselves. Um, and basically taking an awful lot of rent from Coventry, um, investing in mills, because Coventry was obviously famous for its cloth and its woven textiles and its dyes, you know, its woad and its blues and its, you know, halfway on the one by the way to by the way to Lord London depends where you're coming from but the, the London Road runs between Coventry and London um and yeah he's invested in at least 18 mills by the time he dies um invests a lot in medieval Coventry uh, and I suppose although he takes his money very unfairly some would say probably most would say especially those it's been taken from um he does actually invest in things and he does serve his king, which is what a knight is supposed to do. So 
very very loyal man despite being really loyal though he's not popular um and by the time he dies he's got enough land to give walter his son um he's a sir walter he's got his own life as well we could run another video um he has lands in wyken in coventry so he's expanding um as you look at the map of coventry it's at pinley or binley now he's, he's right on the edge going towards rugby and wyken is sort of towards the middle and he's going further and further into medieval into coventry with his lands by the end of it he's owning um if you know coventry at all he's basically owned in all the way sort of from the edge towards Binley, Binley Woods, coming in um, into Wyken, um, into Humber Road, London Road, um, up into Gosford Green, that sort of area. So he's very much on the sort of east side of Coventry. Um, his other son, Geoffrey, either there's nothing written about him or there's everything written about him, which I'll come on to that in a minute. And he's also got um, his eldest son, Robert, who gets lands in and around Somerset. He's got a full estate in, in Somerset um, and he just carries on as a noble wood with land in those times. Um, so that's Geoffrey of Pinley, the first Geoffrey to look at, who has a son, Geoffrey. Then there's also Geoffrey of Middleton. Now, Geoffrey of Middleton, also not much written about him, except maybe there is. And um, the reason I say that is there's a family tree online for Cardinal Langley, who again, um, another video, another time, um, we'll go into that. But um, the, the family tree for him, if you trace it back, there is a Geoffrey de Langley on there who is married to a Mary of Middleton. Um, and um, they've got a son called Geoffrey. They've got a dad called Geoffrey, and they've probably got an uncle called Geoffrey because they're all called Geoffrey. If they're not called Geoffrey, they're called Walter, and that carries on for five hundred years. So, um, looking forward to this family tree. Anyway, um, this Geoffrey de Langley of Middleton. Now, with Geoffrey of Middleton, I can't work out exactly what he did, um, other than be a noble. Um, obviously got land in Middleton um the, the Middleton side I'll look at in another video because it's just going to get too confusing if I do this for every video with everybody called Walter or Geoffrey um so this particular Geoffrey de Langley his father is Thomas and Mary now it's the fathers where I'm usually finding out whether that there is more than one Geoffrey um so the other Geoffrey's father was Walter of Pinley this Geoffrey's father is Thomas of Middleton Thomas of Middleton's father was, you've guessed it, he's called Geoffrey. And he is born, I think, in about 1176 and marries Alianora. Um, not to be confused with the Alianora, who is the daughter of the other Geoffrey of Pinley, who ends up marrying to the Stafford families, which again is another big, 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 big medieval family and worthy of its own video, which I'll do eventually. Um, also not to be confused with Alianora of Montfort, de Montfort, the king's sister, who was married to Simon Montfort, de Montfort and probably didn't marry Geoffrey de Langley, but could have. Follow? Anyway. This Geoffrey de Langley, born in 1176, has a grandson, Geoffrey de Langley, born in 1244. All of them, the Middletons, all over in Kent. Um, at the minute, I don't think they are then related to the other Geoffrey that I found. I think the other Geoffrey I found is more likely to be West Midlands Geoffrey, but it could be Middleton. It could be Middleton Geoffrey because we don't know because the internet thinks they're all the same person. Anyway, so the other Geoffrey that I found, that I think I found, purely because I don't think this can be Geoffrey of Pinley the first, because if he was, he lived to be 180, and that's rare, isn't it? Let's face it. Particularly rare if you're a knight and going off to wars and crusades. So this Geoffrey um, has come under the Pinley banner when I've been looking it up. So that's where I'm thinking he sits. I'm thinking this is the son of the other Geoffrey, the parsimonious justice, king serving, lovely person that he was. Um, this is um, a Geoffrey who fights on behalf of Edward I. He enters the um, crusade 
in 1270, 1271. So again, that would make um, it a year before the other Geoffrey's death. So much more likely to be his son than it is to be him. Possibly even grandson, the speed um, they had children. But we're going to go with son on this one for now. Um, because really, the actual... I'm looking at the family tree. I'm interested because the Langley family goes right back and I love medieval history. So that's why I've been interested in this. The exact relationships isn't sort of mattering too much, but I'm trying to put them together to try and make them make sense. So this one goes on the crusade for Edward the first and comes back healthily and well and full of vigor and life. Um, he then becomes an ambassador for England and um, Geoffrey then became ambassador, diplomat, whatever you want to call it, in liaison with um, Garzan, the leader of the Mongol Empire, who was seeking um, European, Franco-European um, alliances um, to, to help his, his country. Um, wouldn't necessarily say it went successfully, um, but there's a huge text available to read on it, which I've tried to read and maintain some of it in my head, and I can't. It's it's too much for me. Um, I don't know enough about battles and geography. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's that. And there's an awful lot of financial records remain from the time. So there is stuff known about this Geoffrey in terms of um, his negotiations and um, ambassadorship uh, uh, with the Mongols. So then um, Geoffrey is backward and forward um, in and out of Genoa to the Mongol capitals for different reasons, um, all to do with negotiations. And as I say, the financial records survive on that. Um, and eventually he's reconciled back in England to Edward I, um, or Edmund of Lancaster, or Edmund Crouchback, whoever you know him as, um, because um, things are brewing in France. And in 1294, they go to France because French King Philip IV has um, basically deceived the king and taken some of his lands from Gascony and uh, another Franco-English war, Anglo-Franco war, um, breaks out. Um, and Geoffrey goes there as part of his service to the king. So this is another Geoffrey and another campaign to Gascony. This time the Gascon campaign is preceded by a little bit of an uprising and rebellion from the Welsh and a little bit of an uprising and rebellion from the Scottish and they end up in Gascony having their war. Um, I've double checked it. Both Jeffreys live in the time period of a war in Gascony or for Gascony or whichever. Um, and I still think it's two Jeffreys, but I still think this younger Jeffrey is more likely to be the son of Jeffrey, the Chief Justice, um, judging by the parentage and the children they have, which I'll cover on another one. So. First of all, I found it just really fascinating that um, I could trace it back that far and could trace that part of the family back to um, Norman invasion. And prior to the Norman invasion, big Norman families that were living there. Um, the, it's, it's fascinating. It makes you, I'd say, proud, um, interesting to look at. But knowing the suffering that would have been caused at the hands of um, um, is a bit harsh, especially as I've now got to look at all the other generations and all the other members of the family. Um, for me, my great nan was a Langley, and that's how I've traced it back. Um, I'm still working on it, and I'll just update others as I can. Um, but the Langleys so far, especially medieval Langleys, are such a bunch of characters. There'll be quite a few more of these, and I hope you enjoy them. Um, I hope it makes sense. It, it probably doesn't but isn't it fun um so if you would like to um like and subscribe to the channel as i put more langley videos and then probably other videos as i find them um i will update more family videos for the family but also if just if you're interested in history and historical people um for me it's much more about their lives because you read about you read about um kings and what they do and key people in battles and whatever but to actually learn um these little side pieces the information's all there on wikipedia so you can google jeffrey delaney and get as confused as you like um there's lots of it um 
I don't necessarily believe everything I read on the internet, which is why I've tried to back it up with primary sources. So the very fact it was covered in Chronicle Majora was brilliant. And the Langley Cartulary has been fascinating. And we definitely know that these Langleys are related because I've been able to track it back and back. Um, but more will come on that. If you're in the family and you want to know more, message me, drop me a message. If anybody wants to know more, drop me a comment or um, pop me a message over. Um, if you go on um, Facebook or Instagram, there's Vintage Stitches Historical Knitwear. Um, that's the company I run and so I, I pick that up most days. So if you want to ask questions, please do. Um, I might not necessarily be able to answer it just yet, but I'm not going to stop doing this, but I've realised it's so deep. Uh, it's probably going to take me years, so I'll just keep updating as I can. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.